is one of the most familiar sights in our modern world. Yet behind the gleaming glass and polished steel of these modern hospitals, there is a story hidden, the almost forgotten story of a man who dreamed of all this a century ago. We take for granted this fabulous equipment. We know where danger is and how to fight it. Now come to the great metropolitan institution, one of the finest of its kind, just 94 years ago. The same scene before a young man made a strange discovery about hospitals. And the same kind of place where young wives, frightened but filled with courage, came to ask only for understanding, for gentleness, for safety. And they used to ask also to be assigned to a certain young man who had come to join the staff here, Dr. Semmelweis, happy in his work. Very proud of his skill in easing mother's pain. Proud of his growing reputation. Proud to bring good news to the fathers who trust him above all others. A routine case for successful Dr. Semmelweis. The end of the fear and the worry. A healthy baby, a delighted patient. This is any young doctor's chief reward. The last goodbyes of those whom he has served well. Final examination. But the pulse has changed. Too fast. Something is wrong. Prelude to the fatal fever. Almost invisible signs that doctors have come to dread. The signature of death. And from an invisible hiding place, the murderer has already struck. So it is goodbye for the last time. A different farewell than proud Dr. Semmelweis had come to give. Changed in 35 hours from a smiling young woman about to go home with her first baby to a still form covered with flowers. In six years' time, 2,000 young mothers have been carried from this ward without a chance. And no man bothers to know how or why they die. Childbed fever. They have taught him that it merely comes from the air. They have taught him it is the will of God. And yet, is it the will of God or the blindness of men? Night and day through the years, the death bell tolls through the corridors of every woman's hospital in the civilized world. And from this hour on, the sound of this bell will haunt the mind of one man, Dr. Semmelweis. So that here begins the search for a killer whom no one has ever seen. With his assistant through weeks, months and years, the hunt goes on without a clue to find the beginning of a completely hidden trail. Until one morning, while examining an infected subject, the little slip of the scalpel, a trivial scratch, not worth bothering about, hardly a pinprick. Yet, again the death bell rings through the musty corridors. Mysteriously, his dearest friend has been stricken down. Only a scratch, only a pinprick yet large enough to form a gateway into the other world. If this murderer can enter through a scratch, then it must be so tiny that men's eyes cannot see its shape or form. But how does it travel from room to room, striking down sturdy young doctors and strong young mothers? No answer, because for ten centuries men have been saying it is the will of providence. But can it be? that on our hands we are carrying something from operating room straight over to maternity ward, from room to room, from bed to bed, from woman to woman. Yes, we, the doctors who have sworn to save life, are carrying death with us at each step. And when we touch them, it leaps from our soiled fingers into our patient's hearts. We are the murderers. What does it matter if he must drag the head of the hospital from his bed to tell him now, tonight, to begin breaking the chain that stretches from death in the operating room to death in the mother's ward? What does it matter if his superior physician gives him only a grudging permission to experiment? For Dr. Semmelweis has made one of the greatest and simplest discoveries just to keep clean. What does it matter if the others think it nonsense to wash? Women are living who would have died. What does it matter if some of them begin to hate him? The death chart is falling. Who does this young assistant of staff think he is in forcing famous men to actually clean their fingernails? Death is now unknown in the wards. What does it matter if medical men are making a joke out of the newfangled stunts? 
But have you forgotten, Semmelweis, that for every man who welcomes a new idea, there are a thousand to destroy it? And have you forgotten, young Dr. Semmelweis, that you have made your confreres look like fools? And that is the one thing men can never forgive. Else you would not be speaking with such confidence as you say. Therefore, gentlemen, you will forgive the pride with which I have been able to announce this morning. My theory has been sound. My battle has been won. During the eight-month period, I have not lost one mother. For your cooperation, I thank you from my heart. Yet one thing remains, that we now announce our discovery to the entire world. And could you believe your ears when you heard him say, it is my unfortunate duty, Dr. Semmelweis, to disagree. However interesting your little experiments have been to you, they have made this staff the laughing stock of the entire medical profession. Therefore, I must ask you for your resignation. The meeting is adjourned. So comes one of the blackest blots in the long book of men's prejudice, and your reward was utter failure. What does it matter that you saved the lives of endless mothers? The prophet is still without honor in his own country. Yet if it breaks your mind, you must struggle on. Write your half-mad masterpiece. Send it to other countries. Make them see. Write it all down and send it everywhere. The prevention of childbed fever. But no. There are no mentions of your book anywhere. The reviewers will not waste time on you. Medicine is too tiresome a subject. But wait, here is a package for you. Perhaps someone remembers the lives you saved. Your own book returned again, unopened. The human mind can stand up for just so long, then something must give way. It is the final chapter in a man's life. If medicine is deaf to me, I will go to the people themselves. Did you think they would understand when their leaders mocked you as a charlatan and as a fool? Let their wives die, Semmelweis. They still believe it is the will of God. Let women pray that they do not have to bear their children in the hospitals, so long as your enemies can go on with the nice old-fashioned ideas. From room to room, from bed to bed, from hand to hand, from the place of the living to the place of the dead, from the operating room to death and the childbirth ward. Clean hands, what not? Only scrap, only a bit. Therefore, you will forgive the pride with which I announced this morning. Returned again. We are the murderers. Unopened. Only a pinprint. Clean hands. What nonsense. I must ask for your resignation from room to room. From bed to bed, from hand to hand, from the place of the dead to the place of the living, death in the operating room to death in the childbirth war. So did the work of one man come to its end at last. So did he die, so was he buried and forgotten. Forgotten? No. No man who has given the world an immortal idea can be forgotten. Semmelweis never dreamed it, but he was deathless. His book slowly followed the years until it circled the globe. Rich men read it and gave their millions to raise the great clean structures of today. In France, Pasteur was awakened and carried on the message. To England it went where the great Lister raised the banner and down through the years it comes to the nations of today. The knowledge belongs to other men, but the immortal idea belongs to Semmelweis, a simple man who dedicated his life to one idea, that mothers might live.